Welcome everybody, here's your Strategy Wolf and welcome to a special episode at Strategic Command American Civil War. And as I promised, I wanted to um, go into a, do an 1861 overview for you guys since we reached the end of the year. And yeah, last turn was uh, December 24th, so Christmas. And in this one, I want to go through a couple of things with you and give you a good overview. So it's a great opportunity for you guys to catch up or yeah, just get a good summary and overview if you want to. So first of all, thank you very much for watching uh, so far and the incoming feedback and comments. There are not super many, but this is expected and I'm still like just enjoying it very much to let's play again. And yeah, I'm really happy for the support and I'm really eager to continue this project. So yeah, it's going to continue for sure. And yeah, thank you so much. I'm having a great time so far. Um, just for the start, some acknowledgements before we go deeper into it. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't really take end of turn um, yeah, watches, so like I have a view into the state at the end of the turn. So I had to take screenshots from my former videos. So I'm sorry, we can't really scroll around. We have to work with like the pictures that are given. However, it the uh, opposite, uh, positive side uh, in this case is that I could draw a little bit around and you can see my drawings in the map, which is maybe helpful for some descriptions. And bef last thing before we start, um, because also we can't listen to the background music of the game, I started this kind of mix of CSA marches in the background, so it's not my music and I didn't really listen through, so I don't know if there's any let's say, uh, yeah, bad stuff in the lyrics of the uh, of the songs. I doubt it, to be honest, but yeah, I'm still not supporting the Confederate side politically, but for the ambience and the atmosphere, we're going to listen to their marches while I talk a little bit about the stuff. Okay, let's go and have a look at the agenda. So, uh, what we're going to do today, um, we do a summary overview and strategy outlook starting with a front overview and yeah, what happened on these fronts in 1861. After that, I'm going to show you what is coming up in our production queue. We're going to have a look and discuss a little bit about our research and go have a look at the diplomacy. And in the end, we're going to go back to the fronts and basically look at what's going on and yeah, where we can expect some kind of movements in the future or what we can expect. So yeah, enjoy. Let's go into the front overview and 1861 summaries at first starting as always in Arizona, the very west, um, and we see what was happening in, in, uh, during this game in the first 15 turns so far. So basically we had few units coming in here from Texas, we could uh, secure the Chino mine, which was my main target for the sh in the short term. Um, we found some resistance here at Fort Thorn, which we are still kind of sieging or grinding down, and our cavalry brigade pushed up even further north, where we found first resistance of Union troops, so we had a little bit of a skirmish in this area, but had to retreat. Um, and so now we are sieging this, and I'm hopeful that we can siege this down soon, so from that point on we can push further north. What's the background? Um, yeah, we have uh, basically Colorado and Denver and all the um, yeah, routes that come from the west to the Union troops uh, in this area. So if we could cut them off, this would be really, really great. However, I don't really expect it since it's really easy defendable terrain. Still, uh, these troops are here. We got them via event, if you remember correctly. So we're going to use whatever... Uh, yeah. Let's see what we're going to do, what we're going to do with about it. Cut. Um, yeah, actually, so yeah, this is what happened so far. Uh, this is where we are right now. Next turn, we're getting in a mountain division coming in. And yeah, for the strategies, about the strategies we're going to talk about later. Coming to Missouri. So yeah, the Missouri um, area was a kind of a battlefield since the start of the game, especially here at Jefferson City. Um, and if you remember, the, the enemy, the Union brought in troops that basically marched in from St. Louis and surrounded Jefferson City for a while. And it took us quite some time to move these few troops up and in this southern Missouri area. And yeah, this took the enemy surprisingly long. But basically in December or November 61, Jefferson City was fell. So as a result, all the Missouri surrendered to the enemy and returned to the Hexes turned to the Union side 
which led to this a little bit confusing um, display right now where we see uh, a couple of these fields in enemy control however there are no troops it's just flipped and yeah what else happened what's important here to see we saw yeah a little bit later when i had my troops here up i started to kind of scout and see what to, to just to annoy the enemy and moved up here and here and at some point i got really excited and thought i could even relieve jefferson city however we when we saw the amount of troops that the enemy gathered in this area we happily retreated back to waynesville and fort davidson so yeah this is the state of uh, at the end of december 61 here um we managed to, with this cavalry, we managed to open up our supply lines here in this area, so this is already fine. And we also, what was one of the main targets, captured back this, this mine pretty early, so unfortunately I didn't uh, put a unit, uh, a unit on it, so it flipped to the Confederacy and now it got a little bit damaged, so I will not get as many MPP as I hoped to for a while, but yeah, this is a tiny mistake that happens. Um, apart from that, we saw here with this one and especially this cavalry division which moved over here actually, we saw this surprising Cairo raid when we moved up here, cut off two brigades here that we could destroy actually and then even took Cairo which was a fighting spirit objective. However, just for one round after we, that we retreated back over the Missouri River and after some further skirmishes or battles here I retreated back over this river so yeah, here we are with these troops right now. Um, yeah, I don't know what the enemy is going to do in the future, but yeah, that's the situation in uh, Missouri right now. Um, the question is if these troops that came basically to follow us here, if they're going to miss in Kentucky or not. So we're going to see in the next one, coming to our next front, uh, the, no, well, next front, uh, Tennessee and Kentucky. So what did we see here? Here you can see basically what happened this Cairo raid from the other side. Um, this happened actually a couple of turns before Kentucky even joined the war. So in the beginning, as you remember correctly, this was uh, in dispute and I even invested one diplomatic chit in the hope of bringing Kentucky to our side. However, the US, uh, the, the US, the Union invested way more, which uh, resulted basically in the end, which is kind of expected in Kentucky joining the Union. Um, however, we were able to a mass is maybe a too strong word, but we gathered some troops in this area to be ready for this case and started our Kentucky invasions two or three turns ago and moved up here, which at the moment is not meeting a lot of resistance. However, due to bad reconnaissance and so on, um, yeah, we ran into this kind of Hopkinsville ambush and I think it's probably a brigade that was placed by the state of Kentucky anyways. Um, yeah, but this didn't like just stop us for one round. Our divisions, or the reinforcements, cleared this and destroyed the brigade and moved up here, uh, up here. So yeah, we had this little ambush here, and we moved a little bit up here. So, and we tried to go to Paduka, which is about is at the moment um, defended by one regiment, which this brigade couldn't handle alone. So we're waiting for reinforcements here. And yeah. On the, on the long term, this rangers march from the Appalachians from Virginia to here, so these are going to cover this area in the future. But yeah, we don't have to talk about it. This is just like to recap what happened. Just mark to here Nashville, just that you know this is the primary objective from my point of view, since uh, we're going to come back to this later. The uh, relations with European powers, when I control Richmond and so on. Uh, increase, but and also one of these conditions is that no troops, enemy troops are in a four hex range of Nashville, which is basically this area, or it, it, best case four hexes away. So my main interest in this area is actually to defend Nashville, but since there's no troops here at the moment, the offensive is the best defense, so we just move forwards and try to secure as much land as possible. Uh, it's not looking too bad right now. So after some worries about the yeah, cumbersome start into this invasion, after we cleared it, I'm looking more positively at the future here. Okay, coming to the um, to the very east, let's come to go to the seaside, where we had a lot of stuff going on recently. So what happened in in the Virginia coast? First of all. We gotta mention the capture of Fort Monroe, which was very surprising. 
after the enemy at first moved the brigade up here that we could like cut off supply with our own brigade and destroy this brigade here without supply and after that the enemy made from my point of view kind of a huge mistake um yeah she evacuated basically the hq which could have defended even alone against our brigades easily fort monroe and which is a position with a fortification of four really strong so this would have been very very hard for us to take and yeah as you see here is richmond our capital and when i told told you that we get uh, positive relations with the european powers um, if the enemy troops are really far away uh, best case up to the potomac river uh, we get an extra bonus and yeah, this was kind of holding this back. So f capturing Fort Monroe was a really big deal in my opinion Which is even emphasized by us even spending 400 MPPs to kind of buying the siege artillery unit Which you can see here right now, which was meant to support Fort Monroe attack. But yeah, we kind of got it for free. So awesome and After that we moved some troops down and we are considering to build the Virginia Ball and like reference to the Atlantic Val since um, I'm bringing down some engineers here to build some fortifications because after the capture here uh, it's really really high up on my agenda to fortify these positions to also not allow the enemy again to land here in the Virginia ports and areas um, yeah leading to the last event actually of the very December and last turn uh, of 61 the enemy Virginia landing which I don't understand to this point fully, but we'll see how this continues. Since there's two divisions and one HQ, but no port to really supply them. Maybe they try to take Fredericksburg or something like this quickly. And as long as they're here, the moment they're blocking these uh, yeah, improvements in relations with the European powers. However, uh, yeah, I feel like without supply, our newly formed divisions that I put in here will crush them and send them back to the sea. But yeah. We'll see what happens. Um, yeah, I think this was probably not the smartest move, especially when you consider at the moment these could have hurt us here pretty badly. Like two divisions probably could have taken out with some naval support Elizabeth City capturing this port and being there really like a, an annoying position. Maybe maybe not as terrible like as a stable position here, but still. And yeah. This will, until they are back or we have a new naval operation, I hope I will be able to re-solidify our uh, Virginia Val to some extent here and bring some brigades down so that this is kind of a safe position. Yeah, what else? Um, since this is mainly the only scream we are seeing about the sea, um, maritime warfare doesn't really happen from our side. The enemy is successfully blocking um, our some of our convoy roads, but still a lot of stuff is coming through. Um, we don't really have countermeasures at the moment. We just have kind of this fleet and being gunboats here and a little bit south. We lost one gunboat, I think, during and the event capture of Fort Hatteras and these uh, this little island is, is here indicated by the red, uh, yeah, dotted line. And yeah, that's kind of it. Ah, yeah. And then remember our poor Texan Rangers that we tried to transport over the Gulf of Mexico that were shot down from 10 to 1. And uh, yeah, like a kind of a surprise or miracle, they survived these naval attacks and I could retreat them on their like remaining burning ships into the Mississippi River. Um, yeah, but maritime wise, most of our efforts badly failed so far. Coming to the last, to the to the very main front, the Virginia Maryland Potomac front, which uh, saw the first kind of battles or movements in the war actually. So really early on, we were more pushing with the first few volunteers up, and we were able to with this heroic uh, brigade, cavalry brigade, we were able to encircle here and cut off three enemy brigades in Alexandria. Um, which we couldn't, we were able to, basically here, we were cutting them off here and captured Alexandria with this cavalry, which the enemy couldn't relieve anymore, and which led us to the situation where we were able to take them out, at least two of them, while one could escape very, very damaged over the Potomac. And which was, first of all, a very huge morale boost for us, since we had this like, very nice success early, early on. And when I say us, of course, for me, but yeah. <laughs> and furthermore, this was 
I mean, three or two brigades are actually not that big of a deal. But uh, at that very point where the enemy didn't have that many units, uh, it enabled us to push up here to take the Potomac uh, River position which is beautiful and in the end that's the maximum range when we have Richmond here where we want to have troops, uh, no enemy troops, so uh, we get the maximum bonus for the relations event. So that was really great, which led me also to buy this <laughs> this, um, yeah, this, this, this siege artillery for the attack on this one. So yeah, um, <laughs> interesting stuff. This was a very good opening move. So what happened after this? Um, like slowly the enemy started and uh, since autumn the enemy started to, to attack here uh, over the Potomac and actually successfully pushed one brigade of ours away and got one foothold on the other side of the Potomac. However, we could kind of defend this further and um, yeah, this might be confederate propaganda, but let's call it the Potomac blood mill. There are mostly brigades involved, but the enemy took a lot of damage um, attacking us in our, let's say, better position. So I can live with this at the moment very nicely. And yeah, I th also think that over the long, we also destroyed one more brigade here um, with our counteroffensive, but couldn't take the, the field or the hex. But I'm quite optimistic once this situation is cleared, uh, we can bring the reinforcing divisions up here and slowly exchange yeah, brigades for the divisions and at least push back to the Potomac. What else? Um, yeah, the Virginia landing just last turn, as we just discussed in the, the uh, prior picture. And yeah, we had this like one successful Cumberland raid where we could take this fighting spirit objective, objective for one turn. Um, and we, as far as I think or what I know, it didn't really trigger the one Potomac crossing event, which gives the provides the enemy further volunteers. So this was nice um, fighting spirit hit for the enemy, but we retreated back in the woods here. And then there was like little skirmishes here in Western Virginia, where they just destroyed one partisan of ours. And yeah, at first I thought the enemy kind of withdraw or because I couldn't see any further movements or enemies and they moved even up here. But when I already got excited and I was thinking about even maybe planning an offensive from here or something up north, I saw more enemy troops incoming that yeah, solidified the position for him and led to a little bit of a retreat from our side, which is absolutely bearable and no problem since this is kind of West Virginia is not very important for us. The main target here is to control these or hold these um, Appalachian mountain passes so the enemy can't push here in the Shenandoah Valley or to these mines next to Staunton. These are the main and relevant industry objectives for us. And it looks like very unprotected, but first of all, the, the supply situation is really hard here and there's not that many troops. So, And from Richmond, I can move over troops pretty fast. So I'm really at the moment not really worried. Maybe after exchange some brigades here and bring down one or two more brigades to solidify, but this should be fine. Um, yeah, this is basically all of our front lines for the moment, uh, which leads me to the next uh, point, production, research and diplomacy. Starting with production, um, this is the production table as I screenshotted it from our last video, just what is there to keep in mind? So probably here we have, uh, I think, two or three more divisions coming in in January, February. And I also bought, by the end of the turn, one more HQ and division, which probably will appear in March here. So this is what is coming up. Mainly, like, quite important would be Lee, with his, uh, because he's a very strong general with level 8 coming in in June 62. So, yeah. Probably, yeah, we'll come and keep him historically in the Potomac, the top Potomac army or something like this. And some kind of interesting stuff for me, because I never used them in this game, is the submarines coming in in March. And that we're actually researching as well. As well, and we have the monitor, but this takes a long time in November. So, yeah. Um, I wrote down here a wish list. What is a wish list? Of course, everything basically. And um, we've been buying tons of divisions. I feel like, yeah, for the future and for more offensives, I can use more cavalry. Also in the east for reconnaissance and so on. So we have uh, cavalry divisions, native cavalry. Um, of course, in the future, we want corps. Uh, if when we research the corps, they're gonna be the main or major fighting unit. 
then I definitely want more submarines, uh, or because my plan with those was kind of to lay them as traps in front of important harbors. That's what I read makes the most sense. Makes the most sense with them. I don't know how soon we can start producing them. Of course, more divisions would be always nice, and we still have some that can be produced. Um, I was thinking about balloons, uh, like reconnaissance balloons. They can basically spy for a couple of hex fields, which would be awesome at the Potomac because we don't see the second row, but we're gonna come back at this. However, this needs one more research, and I'm not sure if we ever were gonna have the capacity to really research those. So this is, yeah, up to the future. And yeah, in general, more, more, more. And it all uh, depends, of, obviously, on um, how many MPPs we can save or spare for uh, yeah, actions like this. Coming to the research department. Let's have a look here at the research. So this is the current state uh, where we invested and we are fully invested at 3000 MPP research funding, which means we can't go further up. What happened so far? We got one extra hit. Uh, one successful uh, research in the infantry tactic where we immediately researched again. We got one in the hit a success in spying in intelligence where we, in we immediately researched again, as well as with production industrial technology. This is why we all have like two, level two chits in here. So, uh, what's the outlook for the future? Or first of all, let's re like uh, explain the strategy a bit. Um, these fields are basically passive, so they don't cost extra MPP if they research to invest in our troops, while these are in equipment upgrades that would cost extra. So this is why probably a huge focus of mine lies in this field. Still, like, infantry equipment is vital, and yeah, I want it as well as the forts. But it's a little bit different than I would normally go ahead, because I think in a normal game I would have never done, like, double research in spying intelligence. However, this is kind of a special strategy in this game because we checked the reports very early on and we saw the, the Union didn't invest in technology early on. And since spying and intelligence, if you have a edge over the enemy, increases your um, research a bit while the enemy's research is a little bit slower, I invested fully in spying intelligence early on to maybe have a little bit an edge in the speed we research. I don't know if this is going to... Uh, yeah work out but at least this was an attempt and we're gonna like yeah at least continue with that one so yeah even here i have a wish list so what is the wish list we have both cavalry and equipment as well as tactics i talked about balloons and i would really like to strengthen our fort soon so yeah fort is here so we can do it one more after this is done and yeah the cavalry you see are not being researched at the moment Balloons is also one thing here. So basically, since we're at the maximum, we need to wait until something else finishes before we can reinvest. However, there's a lot of things that we will have to reinvest immediately in the same thing. For example, infantry goes here again for sure. Core for sure. The HQ technology is also for sure. Infantry tactics is an option because we have already two chits in West and one of three. So even without another investment, we will come up to three over the long term. So probably I can, re after infantry tactics is uh, researched, I can invest the 150 somewhere else. Same goes for the submarine technologies, both of these. So 100 MPP I could spend somewhere else. And yeah, <laughs> that may be the same as like for skirmishes, because skirmishes are some extra unit for the infantry. Maybe I don't bring them to level two immediately and rather invest the 150 somewhere else when they are researched. Why the other things? So what is really interesting? So cavalry, we have the edge that we already start. It's, this is an edge over the Union. We start with tactics on two out of three. So this can be quickly done. Um, it would be very interesting. And cavalry equipment costs 250, which is heavy and has four, uh, four chits to, to research. I don't know if we're actually too late or if it still makes sense to invest at some point. However, we have tons of cavalry because this also accounts for the native troops and so on where we can upgrade them with this. So I'm still very, very tempted. And yeah, at the moment they're great because they're fast, they can um, they have good scouting and so on. And since the enemy's infantry is also not yet on higher levels, they have still some yeah fighting power. But if I keep the cavalry at zero level basically and the enemy infantry goes up to 
two to three to four at some point they will just they will just be useful to exploit uh, breakthroughs for scouting and so on and i doubt that they will have any real uh, fighting value so yeah this is why it's on my wish list <laughs> we'll see what's going to be possible but the problem is most of the chits are bound here so here i want to definitely want to research double and with spying i really already explained to you um, that i want this um okay this one can fade out at least one hit yeah so much about research that's yeah this is kind of one of the restrictions of the csa we just can spend three thousand to remember you the union can go up to four thousand so this is the reason why they probably can also do naval uh, not engines but naval weapons and these kind of things that reinforce the navy uh, where i don't really see any capacity for us to invest in okay leading us to the last point of this uh, category going to the diplomacy screen um so we started the game with very few investments in diplomacy whilst the enemy did way more um i started to invest a bit in kentucky which is already out here because they joined the union side while the enemy tried to influence more natives and states as well i think but recently we also we had leftover MPP, so we had the chance, so we invested heavily in France, where we put three chits and um, one in UK and one in Apache. So just to remind you, one chit gives you a 3% chance of a success per turn. So yeah, you have 9% with the French and with these each three. And I think one success gives you 10 to 20% uh, movement to your direction. Um, the enemy, I think the European powers would start, start to join our cause at 80 or 90, I'm not 100% sure. However, the enemy gets also an event that can calm them down once one of them or they cross the 70 line for some other investment. So it's very hard to get them there. Remember, this is, uh, unfortunately, last turn I had no look at this. So this is two turns old or one turn old, this this diplomacy, but nothing had have changed so much. So just like the numbers went by one or two percent up here. Um, yeah. There's this slow and steady increase, or not so slow due to our current strategic position. And yeah, I want to support this with the investment in France. And this is because this is our main target. Um, yeah, because we're the furthest here already. So why the investment in UK? I made the investment in UK because I thought maybe if I'm lucky and it hits the UK, the enemy thinks we're investing here and distracts him a little bit. So I want to spread confusion and not... Uh, make it make wanna, not make, wanna make it able for here to realize immediately that we're only going for France. However, I'm not sure um, how I'm gonna continue with this. Whenever I'm pretty sure, whenever a France hit happens, I'm gonna reinvest in France. Um, I don't know what happens if UK hits. If I keep one here in UK, if I also go in France, and what happens if Apache join the war at some point? What I'm gonna do with this shit? France or UK? I don't know. Um, I'm not really experienced in this game with the diplomacy, so let me know what you think and what you have in mind. Okay, so talking about it, um, we are already having outlooks and future strategies, which we are going to go next to. Um, starting again at the front in Arizona. So what is possible here and what's not? So, in the end, I think a lot of strategies are not possible, so the only direction is basically north and further and further. So, yeah, definitely we're gonna clear out this Fort Thorn, and at some point I'm pretty convinced it's going to happen, and then we can push our bigger force versus these dudes here. Question is, can, are they sufficient to break through? Can we push them back? Also considering there's, like, unfortunately not in the map, but up here in the very uh, top left corner we have the uh, Navajo that can go come over here a bit and raid or even block their supply if they're not careful. And we have a mountain division incoming and so potentially also an HQ. So we're getting some reinforcements and I definitely want to try pushing up. That's no debate about this. Just need to keep in mind that here's the, I think the Apache... And also, by when there's uh, Californian troops that could be incoming here from the enemy, like three brigades or something like this. So, yeah, we gotta keep this in mind that there might be counter offenses from this side. Apart from this, we can push up as far as we can get. Um, but it's easily defendable terrain. So, yeah, we'll see what happens at this front. Um, I think it should be easily defendable. However, yeah, if 
if we can keep on going, we'll keep on going. And if there is a defense that is establishing, then is the question basically how many reinforcements we can really sacrifice to bring to Arizona, or if we will just switch to a defensive um, yeah, position, since this was for me the main target so far. And really disrupting the supplies from Denver or capturing Denver is such a yeah, ambitious target that I don't want to dream about it so far. Okay. Looking to the next front, to the Missouri and the strategic uh, perspectives. So, yeah, what do we have here? So, first of all, I'm going to retake these kind of uh, roads and take the territory back that has been switching sides. So, just we have clear supply lines. But after the fall of Jefferson City and I saw the amount of troops here, I doubt very much that I'll be able to push really north here especially next to the railways and so on, so they, where they can easily place new troops. So I'm going to keep what's kind of uh, marked here with the dotted line. This is kind of my defensive position I'm wishing for at the moment. However, it is absolutely not necessary to hold it. Just Fort Davidson has also a good fortification of value of 4. So this is why this brigade stays here even cut off. They get like supply 3, so they will not die until they're really being attacked. Maybe we can open up the supply line, yeah. But if these positions are overrun or too many uh, troops come in here, we can always withdraw a little bit south since there's nothing big to lose in here. First, this mine is really defend uh, valuable to defend, So, but this is far away still and I think we can block it off and get reinforcements in, if necessary. So I think the Missouri front is pretty unattractive for us for further attacks, so this is just a defensive uh, country. However, the very west though, um, we have these plains that look very unattractive at first, but since we have two or three native units down here in Oklahoma that have been clearing up with the situation down there, they will come in as reinforcements. And together with these or these cavalry troops, we have kind of, I'm pretty sure we have the superior numbers of cavalry here and could quickly push up over these plains um, maybe to take Fort Belmont, some native capital, plunder it. Um, I think the Osaji, but I'm not 100% sure. And yeah, I mean, the prime target up here would be this area. Fort Leavenworth um, is a fighting spirit objective, but way more important, you see these blue dotted lines indicate uh, some western convoys, so like minerals or troops coming in from the more western states to support the Union. If we get our troops here to Lawrence or Topeka or especially Fort Leavenworth, we could disrupt this. So this would be awesome. Um, and I think since these troops are freed, we're definitely gonna go for a try. However, as, as, as soon as we meet like serious resistance, I'm not sure if we can keep up pushing with the cavalry, but we're just gonna use the open planes and our flexibility to yeah, see what's possible. Okay. Um, coming to the newest front, the Kentucky-Tennessee front. Um, as I, managed, I mentioned before in the overview, Nashville is the ultimate goal here for me. Uh, this is the main target, so we're gonna want to defend it. At the moment, we're just moving up to gain some room. Um, these towns here are not really precious in terms of industrial output, but yeah, I want to get as much space in between Nashville and uh, the front line as possible. So what are we going to do? Definitely I'm interested in taking Paducah since this actually controls this port which would just, uh, divide basically the rivers, the east eastern part, the Ohio and Cumberland River from the Mississippi. So, And this would be a great position to take out. If we manage to do this, therefore we have, I think, this uh, HQ already in position, this uh, division coming in and maybe after reinforcements this brigade. So here's only a regiment at the moment, so I think we can do this. In, in case there's no reinforcements coming. Um, but we have, yeah, and, uh, here's not so much resistance so far, so probably we're gonna move up here to the Hive River, take positions here. And here we're trying to add Medicine Bill. We already had some skirmishes with this, this division, and as long as this division comes without any support, we hopefully can circle or push up here further to the Ohio. So yeah, if we can push to the Ohio River, great stuff, then we have an awesome position. We just need to look what's coming from the east here, so I guess maybe at some point we can push up here and establish some kind of defensive line here. If 
the enemy still doesn't meet us with any resistance. I don't know how much further we can go or we can tackle Evansville as a fighting spirit objective. But in the end, this is a mainly, I see myself, apart from advancing now and you see how many, like there's gonna be gaps. We don't have that many troops to cover this huge front line. So in the end, it's just like getting good positions right now. And if we can go, go, keep on going, we will, but yeah. Let's be not too megalomaniac or optimistic here and see how this goes. The main target is to hold Nashville. So this is the main strategy here and just let's see how far we can push up. We will get engineers also and I want definitely to apply, deploy some engineers here to build also fortifications, probably here at the river crossings or something like this to definitely defend those. Um, yeah, here and here maybe, around Nashville or even over here at these river crossings. I'm not sure, we'll see. But yeah, these are attractive things. I, I didn't really talk about these forts before. Both these forts are fighting spirit objectives. So yeah, I definitely also want to hold them. And I'm a little bit scared um, without these the first development, these riverboats could uh, definitely harm them. I don't know how many are there. So this is the reason why I'm keeping also the riverboat here to scare it a little bit away. So I really hope for a quick breakthrough in the fort technology. So these would be ones of the first that I will uh, yeah, reinforce with newer technologies and better weapons. Okay, then coming to after this is so much about the Tennessee Kentucky front. And let's come to the final front line, the very, very east to the Virginia and Potomac front. We've been talking about what happened here so far. So what are the strategic outlooks at the moment? I definitely, of course, this is kind of self-explaining. I want to push these guys back to the sea. So, and I'm optimistic this is going to work. Just remember, we just like this is a different screenshot. But if you remember the first uh, overview, we had also a new reinforcements set up here. So there's more divisions. So there's no problem. And with these divisions, I want to come up here to basically reinforce also our Potomac line and take the brigades to either defend the Appalachians. You see here, kind of a defensive parameter I'm planning, maybe also a little bit deeper here, not so relevant. And yeah, and then these brigades can be used also for sea uh, defense wherever we need them. This is basically the current plan. Um, what's on the table? Is there a major offensive here on the table? And I would say, definitely say yes. So even the most boldest one uh, just here. Since we have uh, General Jackson with a level 8, which gives already the 50% bonus on prepared attacks. The enemy doesn't have these good generals at the moment, so this is definitely an edge for us, especially when Lee comes also in by the end of summer. Given the idea that we can replace all these brigades with like strong and fight offensively strong uh, yeah, divisions, and maybe bring in one or two cavalry divisions for scouting and so on, plus our siege artillery, I can assume that if, we, if the enemy is not careful and we bring them nicely and slowly in position without uh, getting too much attention, that we could attack here. And I mean, we need to crush kind of one, two dudes in a, in a one turn. I mean, now they're like, they're gonna be fresh potentially. And then we could cross the Potomac. I mean, it's very, we're just two hexes from, from Washington DC. So this is very, very tempting. Furthermore, we have Annapolis and Baltimore also in range. So, but the deal is if we do so, the enemy gets volunteers by, by event. So this is gonna be in this area. So yeah, it's not gonna be a blitzkrieg, but um, I also don't can't promise this idea right now. So we have several uh, drawbacks uh, because as a, that's the reason why I would love to have balloons, which I can't really afford since I can't see what's behind here. And we don't have ships to clear this up. So if the enemy is building up a massive offensive force and we're running into it, that would be very, very tragic. Uh, however, if the enemy is shipping for troops somewhere else because she thinks and, and it keeps on attacking here because she thinks uh, she thinks we're just in the defensive, there might be even a major surprise possible to push through if we may manage to gather some divisions in the, here in the back. Yeah, so I don't want to exclude it. I don't want to say we're going to do it for sure. It depends all on where we're going to spend or how many um, resources we need to spend on other fronts and where we need them. Yeah, so yeah, this is like the major or interesting, most interesting part, I guess. But as historically speaking, I mean, as far as I know, Lee basically crossed somewhere here at Harpers Ferry, historically the Potomac and went, I think, Gettysburg somewhere like up here. 
So this is also an option. However, since we don't have the reconnaissance and this is so close and it's gonna be a grindy uh, bloodshed, I'm why not going straight for Washington and using some offensive mo momentum if we're already that close. This is the difference to the historic setup. I think, historically speaking, the Union at least had like Alexandria these lines while Lee was pushing over here. So, yeah, it's it's absolutely uh, possible. Let's see where this is going to lead to. Okay, that's it so much for 1861. Uh, I think you saw all the options and the ideas and a good summary of what we did. Um, so in general, uh, thank you for watching a lot. And yeah, I'm really sad we couldn't actually go into statistics and numbers on the graphs since, yeah, uh, as I told you, this is all screenshots and the graphs are in the turn. So I really hope I remember this and we'll find the times where we we'll study this a little bit more. Maybe it depends also on the turn. And yeah, you can have a little bit, we can have some insights in production numbers, unit numbers, fighting spirit and so on which is definitely missing in this video, but yeah, uh, next time I'm going to do, I'm gonna do like 1860 and a half, 1860, 1862 and a half, or 1862N, year, and then I really try to think about not sending the turn already, so we can have a little bit more of a look in the game together. Yeah, um, in general, once again, I'm very happy for you guys following and letting me know stuff. Um, it's been a blast so far and we're gonna keep on going. So stay tuned. Please let me know what you think, what your strategies would be like, what do you think of mine, uh, what do you propose. I'm happy to, like, now we're really close from production to, to airing. So I'm absolutely able to follow ideas or strategy proposals if you make nice ones. Um, Please let me know what else you want to see, if there's general wishes, how this channel or where we can develop to or this, this playlist. And yeah, I'm really happy about any kind of comment. So exactly. Don't forget to leave me a comment or a like and subscribe. Um, you know, this means a lot to me since, uh, of course, we're not that many people that can do this professionally by now. But uh, I'm having so much fun and I hope I can continue producing videos over the next month and for potentially years, I don't know. And for for doing so, I definitely need uh, to follow the <laughs> how the world ru runs. So I need your likes and subscriptions. And yeah, also it's nice for you so you wouldn't miss if new interesting stuff is coming out. So really, I hope you liked it. Uh, thank you very much. See you next time in a regular episode. So yeah, let's look forward to an interesting and probably even more intensive 1862. Thank you so much. See you next time. Your Strategy Wolf.